Dr. Bryce Dyer for Sup Border. And this time I'm going to take you through another piece of equipment that's managed to catch my eye of late. And what's the piece of equipment? It's a race board and it's the GT by Lightboard Core. Probably not a brand you might have heard a lot about before. There are two reasons why this board has caught my eye. Now the first one is that Bruno Hasselow, the world champion, has signed with the brand to race for them from 2019. And the second thing is because of this. It's hollow. It only weighs nine and a half kilos, which is about four kilograms less than most of its contemporary competition on the race board market. It's an all water board with some flat water tweaking. It's 308 liters and it comes in a range of custom colors and finishes. You can choose the kind of color that you want and the kind of finish and some, the patterning on the board as well. So that gives it quite a unique feel to predominantly most other race boards you'll find on the market. But it's not a brand that's had a lot of exposure. It generally seems to be centered around Germany and, and Central Europe. So we haven't seen a lot of it in many of the other countries and that's probably gonna change. So I've been itching to get my hands on one of these or one of the boards from this particular brand for a couple of years now. And I finally managed to do that. Now I've had this board on loan for a couple of months. I've logged about 20 hours of paddling time on it uh, and in a range of water states and conditions. Everything else from flat water to estuary chop to up to about a foot to two foot of winter chop depending on you know, depending on wintry conditions and a range of winds from nothing at all right the way up to what I would call sort of moderate you know, force three to force four winds. So whilst I haven't pushed the board to its absolute extremes I've managed to log quite a few hours more than most demos or most sort of uh, loans you'd normally get from the board. So I'm going to take you through the features show you some of the science that I've discovered about it and give you back some of the experience I've had over the last couple of months of me using it. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the features that the board has got. Obviously starting at the nose. One thing you're gonna see is you look quite carefully, you're gonna see, especially in the light that I'm actually filming this in, that the stand of the finish is very, very glossy. It's, in, it's probably the best quality finish on a board I've ever seen. Um, because it's made probably using principles that are closer to kayaks or surf skis than necessarily traditional surfboards. The board is extremely well finished, uh, it gets a very clean release obviously in the manufacturing mould and then is then polished and polished over and over again. We've got a drain plug and obviously information plate and you can see there that, uh, you know, that it's been manufactured by Nello. And for those that don't know who Nello is, it's probably the most or one of the most successful brands in Olympic kayaking over the last few decades. We bring it round, the board itself it's got a single handle, single grab handle directly in the middle. There are no other options to move that around, um, but the handle is extremely well positioned. When you lift the board up, it's perfectly balanced. It's just in the right place. We've then got a diamond-based grip pad that starts at the front, transitions right the way down to the tail where it turns, obviously turns into a black color and then goes to the tail. Um, something else you might be able to see here, I've got a ruler to help show it, is that the actual rails the actual edge before the grip pad starts, we've only got about 20 millimeters there. Now that's quite thin, which means it allows you to get your stance width um, as wide as possible and actually considerably wider, I found, than foam boards. Because foam's so much more fragile, they need often a lot more material around this area, make this a lot thicker, which presses your feet further inwards, thereby reducing your stance and reducing your perceived stability. On this case, they minimize the material so much that you could really do feel like you've got a stance width of something closer to a 28 inch wide board, not a 23 and a half. Um, just something I picked up that I'd be aware, the actual grip pad here doesn't go quite to the edge. And this was actually a, a source of irritation for myself because I found that my foot had a tendency to drop into this gap here. And as a result, it just felt like my foot wasn't flat and this would dig into my feet. So realistically, a nice little improvement would be to take this grip pad right the way up to the edge. The grab handle in the middle there is affixed under normal sort of methods. It's just a single bolt there, single bolt there. And then obviously the board then transitions right the way back to what is ultimately a very, very square tail. Now that tail, if I just measure that off for you now, is approximately 13 and a half inches. So that's actually pretty standard tail width for an all water board. It's not unusual. Um, and it gives you plenty of stability when you step back. Also on the black pad, on the uh, tail pad there, the kick pad, it has got a slight lift on it at the end, so you've got something to shove the heels against and you can really feel that you're not stepping back too far and you can get good traction when you take it round 
buoys and things. Okay, let's take a quick look at the, uh, the underside profile of this board first. So I'm just gonna bring you up to the nose and I'm gonna take you through how the curvature changes. So as you'd expect at a nose, there is a fair amount of curvature. Now the interesting thing is, as we start moving backwards, now this position now is just, uh, just directly in front of where the feet is, you're gonna see that it actually flattens off quite considerably. There is a very, very slight concavity, but it's extremely light, it's predominantly flat before it then tails off. As we move back a little further, again, remains quite flat. Again, you can see there is just from here to here, a extremely light concavity, but I think in most eyes, this would be considered quite a flat bottom. If we now go back to the area where you probably start to think about performing step back turns, again, that flat profile is continued. The concavity has actually opened up just a little bit here. You can see it's now dropping down about three millimeters. And then as we go back to the tail, again, the flat profile is continued right the way across. We've got the tail itself, and I should mention at this point, this fin here is not the fin that actually comes with the board. The fin that comes with the board wasn't actually supplied to us, so I've actually been experimenting with a series of different fins uh, to try and tune the best and try and get the best out of the actual board itself. As we come back to the last stage at the very tail, this really is predominantly completely flat now. Uh, so when you do step back turns, you're gonna get maximum stability out of this particular board shape right the way back to the very end. Now, when we get to the very end, it literally just drops away, it's a square cut. Likewise, as you're gonna see here in the rails, these are incredibly square rails, right the way up. If I can actually just sort of show you, you know, with the hand there, you can see here, so you're gonna get a very, very high level of tracking, um, and you're also gonna get quite a good secondary stability, because as this board starts to roll over and dig in, this is going to provide a tremendous amount of resistance to preventing the board from rolling too much. So it's going to be a relatively predictable shape. Here we're at the tail end of the board. What you can see is it's got a very, very square cut tail. That's going to give you a lot of lateral stability. What I liked about the board as well is if you look at these rails, they were square right from the very front, right the way back to where it transitions into the tail. Now why that's good is it means that wherever you're stood on this board, whether it's right at the very front up by the handle, or whether you're traversing back to perform a tail, you know, a tail kick or a maneuver of some description or another, you're gonna have a relatively similar feeling stability right the way from fore to aft. That's great, so it means that the levels of primary and secondary stability aren't gonna change a great deal, no matter how well, you know, where you're positioned on this board. We've got the raised kick pad here, so you can jam your heel against it, you know exactly where the end of the board is, and there is a single leashing point. It's the only leashing point on the board, I should say, but there your single leashing point is right here behind the kick pad. Obviously, we've got Nello's brand there as well, mentioning about it, and the key thing here is the board's designed by one company and effectively manufactured by another. So having talked about the board's features, let's just talk about some of the experiences I had when actually using the board. Now, the first thing really is, and this is kind of a warning, but it was kind of cool as well in that this board is going to behave completely differently to any board you've used before. And the reason for that is because of the fact of its hollow construction. Uh, for those that have done uh, surfing will know what I mean. When you switch to a board that's much lighter, the board can become much more reactive. In other words, it's much more sensitive to changes in uh, weight distribution and whatever you're doing. It doesn't mean that the board is necessarily tippy. What this board means is, is that it's, it's just so much more immediate to what you do with it. So if you step back, the nose will come up quickly. If you, if you do a kickback turn, the nose will swing around fast because it's got so much less weight to shift. It's a bit like, um, I've, I've talked about this before, about inertia. In fact, sort of a bargain basement science is if you take two drinks water bottles, fill one with water and freeze it, leave one empty, and actually try swinging two around, you can see how much more immediate the hollow one is compared to the one that's got a lot more weight in it. And that's because it takes more energy to give a change in direction. And it's basically the same with this board. You're, you're gonna find that it is incredibly sensitive to your movements. Now, luckily, what I liked about the design was because it's got very, very square rails, the level of secondary stability is quite high. And just to recap here, 
Primary stability is the initial tipping issue you get on the board. Secondary stability is when it will start to roll and roll and roll, and it's that resistance just before it's about to kick over. With square rails like this, you find it really does bite in. You can take this board over a long way, and it still won't feel like it's going to go at any moment. So when you pair that with the low inertia of this board, it does counteract what is, to be frank, a very, very lively feel. It took me quite a while, and I think I'm still learning really, to just get used to this board, its, it's reactivity. But then here's the plus point. This thing is the fastest accelerating board I have ever used by some margin. Any results I give you are always going to be relative to myself, my standard of paddling, what I was doing that day, physical fitness, etc., etc. But when you're on a board that weighs four kilograms less than its competition, what that effectively means is you can hit top speed faster. So coming out of turns, coming off the start line, you're going to have a massive advantage there because you're going to hit that top speed a lot quicker. There is a downside to that in the sense of that it actually, in many ways, there is a theory that with heavy boards, it's easier to maintain an average speed because you're maintaining momentum. The board isn't tailing off quite so much in its losses. And what I mean by that is if you if you're like myself and you've had accelerometers or an iPhone strapped to a board, what you'll find is when you paddle a board, it accelerates and then obviously it deaccelerates. And when you have a heavier weight behind it, it does have a tendency to hold that higher speed, whereas with a lighter weight, you do lose or you have to be much more attentive, possibly using a higher cadence stroke just to keep that speed topped up. But there's no denying the fact that this board is fast. And in the time trials I did, which I did five over known courses with everything from three to five kilometers in length, that's everything from anything between 10 minutes and 30 minutes, this board was the fastest board I have ever tested. And I, I would put that, I think the board prior to this that I used, uh, the Starboard Sprint 21 and a half inches wide last year's model, this was as fast as that was despite being wider, partly because of the fact that I liked and welcomed the extra width of this, but also the fact that I found that the extra weight really, really helped the board. What else we've got here with this is the tracking as well. This is one of the best boards I've ever used for tracking. Now, there's a bit of a caveat on that because like I mentioned, um, the actual fin that comes with this board wasn't supplied to us. So I've used quite a wide range of fins. And to be frank with you, I preferred using bigger and bigger fins as time went on. One, to slow down the rate of roll to try and this, uh, this active feel that this board has, I wanted to have that slow down just a touch so I could react a bit better to it. So I used quite long fins. Uh, and fins with quite a lot of surface area. Likewise, other paddlers may prefer something that's a little smaller, a little bit more reactive, but I found for me that worked quite well. Um, but the tracking on this board, mainly in, uh, caused by the square rails from really from that point in front of where your feet are right the way back, means I could paddle almost indefinitely on one side of this board, and I've only ever had that on boards of 21, 22 inch widths to be able to do that. So it's an incredibly good design. Uh, particularly for distance racing and those where you are trying to maximise your efficiency by maintaining a straight line. In terms of the nose characteristics, it's, it's again got quite an odd feel. The actual nose shape itself isn't unlike something like a, a Nash Maliko, uh, SICRS, something like that. You get this lovely light kind of splashing feel. But the weird thing about this particular board is it's so stiff because it's made in a similar fashion to surf skis, kayaks, boats, that sort of thing. There's no flex in this board at all. So it has this really weird kind of skipping action and it does feel like, because of the stiffness, because of the immediate feel, that all your energy is going forwards and isn't being wasted. It can make it a little unforgiving, but it is incredibly effective at what it does. Um, you, you don't realize until you go back, and I went back to a, my normal training board, which is exactly the same width as this, 23 and a half inches wide, and you do start to sense then how much flex a foam board can have, and sometimes just how, well, how unproductive that can be to you moving forwards. Turning does require some practice. Like I said, the reduction in weight does make it incredibly easy to turn because there's less weight there you've got to, you've got to bring round. But then likewise, it does mean that turns happen a lot faster. You've got to be a little bit quicker on your feet and it can make things feel a little bit more you know, unstable. The build quality uh, was one of the key things for me. The lightweight isn't just good because of the way it moves in the water. It actually makes the usability and ownership of a board a lot better. Uh, carrying it to and from your garage to your car roof, lifting it on a car roof, getting it on and off the water is so much easier with a board that 
only weighs eight bags of sugar. So I found that from a whole user experience, really, really good. And then lastly, with also with the build quality, it does seem to take the knocks a little better. This thing is really stiff. Yes, it's got gel coat. Yes, it's hollow. Yes, it could chip, but not in my experience. Um, it's easy to keep looking clean, keep looking new. Needs a good wipe down and the clean, but it really is considerably stronger, considerably more robust than any other race board I've ever seen. Foam boards aren't particularly reliable, I find, for build quality and longevity. This board will stay looking as good as the day you bought it many years after you've actually got hold of it. So overall, who is this board actually best suited to? Well, in my opinion, at 23 and a half inches wide, this is gonna be for your racers. And based on my experiences, I think you need to be a good intermediate to advanced level of paddler to be able to handle the, and enjoy the board and get the most from it. It's more stable than a 21, 22 inch wide board, but realistically, because of its low weight and low inertia, immediate reactive feel, it is gonna require you to retrain some of the skills that you've got Muscles will need to fire faster, you'll need to react quicker, and it does take time. I'd recommend buying the matte finish, not the gloss finish, purely because of the fact that gloss will show every imperfection in the surface. If you accrue damage over the years, or you ever need a repair, or just in, in terms of expecting perfection when you buy one, the great thing with the matte finish is it disperses light across the whole surface, and I think will stay looking better for longer. The method of construction is something badly missing in the industry, I feel. The, the build quality of this is the best build quality board I've ever seen. It will stay looking as good as the day you bought it on the day that you get rid of it and move it on, if you're ever going to want to do that. And if you look at the likes of Nello, who have built kayaks and surf skis for some time, the quality of there is never in question. It's very, very high quality, so I wouldn't have any concerns about that at all. And I think it's something for other brands to think about here, that this really is a different way of doing a board design and I certainly think it's a step in the right direction in terms of increasing performance. Let's look at the pros and the cons then. Let's look at the cons first. Value for money, it's getting a little bit questionable. A board like this is going to be north of £3,000 know, sterling. Um, that's at the high end, uh, but I think that's not necessarily the fault of this particular brand, that's a fault of the industry as a whole. Prices are getting quite high and I think they're on the verge of potentially pricing people out of the market because it's too high. I can buy a racing surf ski or an ocean ski or a kayak for considerably less using the same method of this. So I'm, you know, the value for money really needs to be there in the future. I think that's something that the industry is at risk with. Could this sink? Well, yes, I suppose potentially put a hole in it. But again, if you look at the quality of Nello's other products, and if you look at the, this method of construction as a whole in other parts of the industry, it's very, very robust. It is unlikely to be a problem. Um, the low weight can make windage more of an issue with this, both carrying it to and from the beach or the, the water's edge, loading it on and off the car. You've got to be a little bit more mindful. This board is light. It will blow away in the breeze if you're not a little bit more careful. But that just requires a little bit more foresight. The big thing for me, though, is really that only one width of this board is available. 23 and a half inches wide is great for racers, but I think the many advantages that this method of construction, quality of board and design offers and yet they haven't offered anything for someone that would be a more of an everyday paddler, possibly paddling something in the 26 to 28 inch range. I think they've missed a trick there, and I think actually, to be honest with you, that'll be a far bigger part of the market than something like this would be in the long run. In my view, the board's construction, a radically different feel is absolutely awesome, but realistically, you've got to get used to the fact that I think there's quite a steep learning curve to using this kind of board because of its lightweight and low inertia. You need to allow more time to get used to it, put more hours into it. It will not be as possibly a smoother transition or change you may have had when moving from a foam core board to a foam core board. But let's look at the pros. In terms of speed, there is no denying this is a fast board. I, the records I've personally set with this board of my time trial courses are as quick as the fastest or quicker than the fastest board I've ever used. Um, so I'm extremely pleased with the performance of this. I think in terms of day-to-day -day usability, I like the way that it's easier to get it to and from the garage, the car, the water's edge. It does make carrying equipment around more of a joy. I think that's not to be underestimated. Um, is lighter faster? The science is out on that. In terms of other areas of watercraft like rowing skulls and kayaks and things, the science says that a weight reduction of this level won't make a lot of difference in your performance. However, that's when you're actually looking at watercraft that are optimised 
for slicing through the water and have perfectly tuned shapes. Sups don't have that because they have to deal with us being on it. They need to provide a level of stability and as a result compromises have to be made and you can see this because the rate of deacceleration every time you take your paddle out of the water when you measure it on an iPhone you, you can use your sensors to do that it's quite steep if you don't keep paddling boards come to rest quite quickly yet rowing skulls and, and kayak shells don't have that problem so I think the science doesn't necessarily apply in that kind of way to this kind of board and as a result I personally feel that the weight reduction is certainly worth having um, it certainly reflected that in my sprint speeds and my steady state longer time trials that I actually did. Overall, for me, this board is probably a game changer. Is it the best design out there? I thought the design was extremely well sorted. It might not be the best design for everyone. However, even if you ignore that, the method of construction, the reduction in weight and the quality of finish, for me, makes this a game changer in the industry. And certainly a lot of brands are looking at this because of competitive advantages here. And I think this is the much needed shake up that race boards need because we're coming to a point of diminishing returns and converging designs where a lot of brands boards are starting to look the same. Light board cores approach was so much better because it really has taken it from a different direction. And I think it's gonna drive high levels of performance by doing things a little bit differently.